Good afternoon, all. For our master series today, we have Dr. Anil Karapurkar, who is a senior consultant endovascular neurosurgeon, currently working at Indraprastha Apollo Hospital in New Delhi. He has previously held office as president and is member of many national and international associations. Dr. Anil is also has written numerous publications and book chapters in his name. He is a great orator and teacher. We are thankful to for him for him being here for giving an interesting topic, thrombectomy for acute stroke. On behalf of Doplexis, I welcome you, sir. You can start your presentation right now. Thank you so much, uh, Doplex, uh, for having me here. This is a platform where I hope that I can spread awareness about what we are doing today for stroke. Uh, one small correction, I was in Indra Prastha, Polo, Delhi, but I've been back in Mumbai now for several years. So I am now working at the Bridge Candy Hospital. Uh, doctors and the medical community at large has been very nihilistic in their approach towards stroke. So what is stroke? Stroke is a sudden loss of function of a part of the body. It could be chakkar, it could be blindness, it could be paralysis, it could be loss of sensation, it could be transient or it could be permanent. Headache and vomiting or convulsions is also one of the hallmarks of acute stroke. What we have to remember that it is the second most common cause of death in India today. And it is a disease of age. As we grow older, there will be many more patients who will have stroke. And now with our life expectancy being more than 65 years, you can imagine the number of patients that we will have in the country. 40% of patients die after a major stroke. 30% of patients need full support. And 50% do not go back to work. So can you can imagine the magnitude of the social problem. Some may find this very basic, but I thought I will also cover a part of the neuroanatomy, which I'm sure general practitioners and uh, I won't say physicians, but certainly young practitioners will need to be reminded about. So we have the cerebrum, cerebral hemispheres, the cerebellar hemispheres, and the two are connected by the bridge called the pons, the middle cerebral, the brain stem. The brain stem consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And this is the lateral surface of the brain. So you can see that the cerebral hemisphere, the leg area is small. The face and the arm area is huge because we our face is very mobile and it needs a big representation of the brain. At the back, we have the occipital lobes with which our vision is interpreted by the, by the brain. What goes through the optic nerves is interpreted in the occipital lobes. So we have the motor area, we have the sensory area, and this is the large frontal area which defines humans. We are basically going to talk about the plumbing of the brain. So the plumbing of the brain consists of the two carotid arteries on the two sides, the two vertebrae which join to form the basilla. And the, the anterior cerebral, I mean the anterior circulation, the two carotids are connected by the anterior communicating artery. So this is the internal carotid artery. This is the middle cerebral artery. This is the anterior cerebral artery. And the two anterior cerebral arteries are connected by the anterior communicating artery. This is the posterior cerebral artery at the back. The internal carotid is connected to the posterior cerebral arteries by the posterior communicating arteries. So this is the circle of Willis. So this is what keeps the cerebral circulation going. So if the left carotid is occluded, the circulation is maintained either through the posterior communicator, the PCOM, or through the anterior communicator, the ACOM, or sometimes even through the ophthalmic artery. So this is the ophthalmic artery, the eye which goes artery which goes to the retina and which communicates with the external carotid. So the brain tries to maintain its blood flow as far as possible. So there is a big difference in the symptomatology depending on whether the anterior circulation is involved or the posterior circulation is involved. Anterior circulation also, if it is a dominant hemisphere, 
the patient will lose his speech. Most of us being left uh, right handed, our speech area is on the left side. If you are left handed, the speech area is usually on the right side. But sometimes, because in most families, a left handed person is made ambidextrous, it is confusing which side is dominant. Posterior circulation strokes can be very difficult to diagnose even for a neurologist sometimes because the symptomatology and the signs can be very varied. So it can be vertigo, blurred vision, imbalance, hoarseness of voice, difficulty in swallowing, uh, loss of vision. So it can be a occipital lobe where there is a complete blindness, bilateral or visual field defects or it can be double vision depending on the eye movements if the eye movements are impaired. Usually in hemorrhage, there is severe headache and vomiting. But in lobar hematoma, there may be no headache and no vomiting. Our bane is that we do not know when a patient presents. Does he have a ischemic stroke or does he have a hemorrhagic stroke? Because 85% of strokes are ischemic. 15% of strokes are hemorrhagic. And I've been doing neuro intervention since 1980. For the first 40 years, we were, 20 years, let us say, 25 years, we were concentrating on, on hemorrhagic stroke. We were doing very little for ischemic stroke. We started stenting carotid arteries in 1996 and 97. But we are really doing something for acute stroke only in the last five years. And luckily for us, industry has kept pace with us. So what are the causes of ischemic stroke? Today, we are going to talk about ischemic stroke. Let's confine ourselves to ischemic stroke. So what are the causes of ischemic stroke? So it can be thrombotic or it, they can be embolic. They can also be hemodynamic. If there is a severe stenosis of the artery, the brain demands more, blood is not able to reach, it can be hemodynamic. So 85% of strokes are ischemic. Thrombosis of a major artery is a major problem problem and nowadays that we have recognized we are seeing more and more patients with dissection of the carotid artery and also of the vertebral artery. So dissection is again a very important cause of stroke especially in the young. Hemorrhagic stroke on the other hand is the most common cause is hypertension but it can be aneurysm, AVM, neoplasm etc. So today we will talk about ischemic stroke. Everybody knows about the heart, but about the brain, there is an abysmal lack of knowledge. And this is because there is a big difference between the heart and the brain. The heart has only one function and only one structure muscle. Brain, the structure differs in different parts of uh, frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital. Each part has a different function. Heart has only one function, that is to pump blood. Brain, depending on which area is affected, that function will be lost or impaired. Heart attack is only loss of blood supply. It is always always ischemic. So you can start treatment at home. But a brain attack may be ischemic or it may be hemorrhagic. So you cannot start treatment at home. You need to have some form of imaging before one can start treatment. So you cannot give aspirin, you cannot give molecular heparin at home. Patient has to go to a hospital, get some form of imaging done. And even after a major heart attack, a patient is completely independent. He can look after himself, he can do him, everything himself. But even a minor attack of the brain may leave a patient completely dependent. Supposing a small infarct in the brainstem, in the pons, in the medulla, can lead to massive neurological deficit. Similarly, in the speech area, it can cause major problems. What are the types of stroke? TIA is the most common type of stroke. It's a transient ischemic attack. The definition has always been recovery within 24 hours. But if you wait for recovery to occur, it is too late to do anything. So you have to assume that when you see the patient or hear the symptom for the first time, you have to assume that this is not a TIA but major stroke. The second is stroke in progression. It starts as a minor thing in the hand, in the finger, but gradually ascends to the entire arm to the trunk, to the leg, or to the speech. So that is stroke in progression. And sometimes you can get a complete stroke right from the beginning. 
like if there is a total occlusion of the internal carotid artery either because of a thrombus or because of an embolus from the heart going and blocking the internal carotid artery or the basilar artery the patient may come comatose so that's a complete stroke we must remember don't make a diagnosis of tia unless you are sure that this is a tia so tia is a retrospective diagnosis if you want to wait for a patient to recover it is too late so why why are we so insistent upon time because we can give an in, intravenous injection actylize or tenecte plates in the first 3 hours only in some imaging criteria if on mri or in ct you don't see a big infarct then you can extend the time to 4 hours but we cannot extend beyond 4 hours for an intravenous injection i used to do a lot of thrombolysis for for stroke in thrombolysis uh, intra arterial thrombolysis we used to take a micro catheter right into the thrombus in the artery whether it was basilar whether the middle cerebral whether it was internal carotid we used to take a micro catheter in there and inject urokinase or rtpa and dissolve the clot but today since 2015 what we have been doing is thrombectomy and we have had such excellent results that i would say that today if patient comes in time thrombectomy must be offered to every single patient now thrombectomy cannot be done in every place so in some places in some hospitals in some cities the patient may go to a hospital where there is no interventional uh, radiologist cath lab so in such places iv can be given and the patient can be shifted to a hospital where complete care is possible so that is called bridging therapy so you drip and ship so you start the drip of actylize or tenecte place and then ship the patient to the hospital now we are insisting that again let me insist again time is of essence why are we worried we are worried because if we are delayed then there is a risk of hemorrhage the white infarct the pale infarct becomes a red infarct becomes a hemorrhagic infarct and after 8 hours we cannot do any specific treatment whatever recovery is to take place will take place spontaneously the penumbra the edge of the core the in fact core will recover if blood flow is restored which happens with collateral circulation if there is no restoration of blood flow then the patient it the whole the small infarct can become a big infarct because the penumbra is also gone so after 8 hours only rehabilitation is possible and i can assure you if you have a patient who has got a brain stem stroke or who has got a dominant hemisphere stroke the patient lives provided he is given very good nursing care so many posterior circulation patient strokes have a tracheostomy have a peg they are fully conscious they are able to understand everything but they are not able to communicate they cannot talk they cannot move their hands or legs so this is one of the most depressing sights if you have seen a patient with a posterior circulation stroke so again i insist time is important so what should a physician do if he is informed that the patient with the stroke is coming don't let him wait in the clinic don't let him wait in the consulting room outside take him inside first examine that patient first and send him to the nearest place where a ct or mr is possible or where if you have a nearby stroke ready center that is the place that the patient should go to and you should insist not only on ct but we should insist on a ct a because we need to see whether a big artery is occluded if a large vessel occlusion lvo is seen then thrombectomy is required iv alone will not be enough so if you already know that there is a cta or mra showing a major of large vessel occlusion patient should be sent to a center where thrombectomy is possible in the hospital what should the doctors what the hospital should do is activate the stroke team by the time the patient come by the time the other doctors come the the uh, icu the the casualty the ems ems emergency medical services doctor should do a quick neurological examination and record the nihs score the national institute of health uh, stroke score is recorded because patients may progress he may come with a facial weakness 15 minutes later he may develop arm weakness half an hour later he may develop leg weakness so you must record what is happening we do a quick blood sugar creatinine pt and apt blood tests 
if the sugar is more than 400 we start insulin and if it is less than uh, 65 we give glucose if the bp is more than 200 we reduce it with labetalol if the bp is below 180 we don't treat 160 150 we don't treat leave it we treat bp only if it is more than 180 and for that ideally we should use labetalol iv labetalol and as fast as possible shift for ct or mr even uh, in, in many stroke pro in uh, many stroke ready hospitals a stroke protocol is in place for mri and though mri takes more time if you have a stroke protocol ready the stroke uh, imaging can be done in 13 minutes 1 3 13 minutes and i can assure that this is being done in many places and in many places if a patient is already on the mri machine as soon as that sequence is done that patient is taken off and the new stroke patient is put on and the stroke protocol is followed and the patient is taken out and the next patient is then put back in to complete the time and in stroke ready centers what they do is to record the timeline so door from the patient reaching the door to the patient reaching the ct or mri from the ct mri as soon as the diagnosis is made to needle for intravenous injection of uh, at alteplase or um, tenective place from ct mri to groin for femoral puncture from groin to recanalization where the artery is recanalized so in each stroke ready center an effort is made to reduce the time between each step so that after the patient has reached the hospital the patient will take time to reach the hospital the traffic getting an ambulance all that will take time so in fact in some centers today they have mobile ambulance so you can start the the imaging at home or what in some places for instance in Coimbatore, my friend uh, matthew cherian does is he gets the ambulance he sends his ambulance the patient comes by his ambulance they meet up somewhere the patient is transferred ct is done and the patient is started on at least the iv treatment right away so the main thing is that time is of the essence. COVID is a new paradigm. And COVID times, stroke is, of course, a very big problem. Patients don't go to stroke, uh, with stroke, don't go, mild stroke, don't go to the hospital. Patients with major stroke do go to the hospital, but they may, be diff may find it difficult to get an ambulance, may find it difficult to get an ICU bed. And... Uh, so, COVID has its own problems, but what is done is typically is, since when a patient comes into the hospital, the doctor does not know whether the patient has COVID or not. It is assumed that the patient is COVID positive. If intervention is required or patient is restless, intubate the patient in the casualty itself. And then shift to patient to CT or MRA. And if somebody is thrombectomy is required, the patient is shifted to the cath lab. Patient is not extubated in the cath lab. The patient is shifted to the ICU on a ventilator and the patient is ex extubated in the cath lab. And of course, everyone, all the staff, the nurses, the ward boys, the sweepers, the doctors, everyone has to take precautions for, uh, for COVID. Now, CT scan will show the hemorrhage very well, but it will not show the infarct. So if you have hemorrhage like this in this scan, you can see that this is subarachnoid hemorrhage, this is a large lobar hemorrhage, this is cerebellar hemorrhage, and uh, to a same patient, with a large cerebellar hemorrhage. This is a hemorrhage on the, in the uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. And this is how a CT shows the hemorrhage. On the MR, you may not see the hemorrhage as well, as you can see here. The intraventricular hemorrhage is very well seen here, but not as well there. So, hemorrhage is very well seen. So, on a plain CT, what you try and do is to roll out a hemorrhage. It is difficult to be sure whether there is an infarct here. Take this patient, for instance. This same patient, scan on 21st, Almost normal, there is nothing there. Whereas, one day later, you can begin to see the infarct here. So, the first 72 hours, sometimes the scan may be normal. And many times, I have had family doctors who come with the patient say, Are scan to normal, hai, kya ki baat hai? but if the patient has got paralysis and the scan is normal, in fact, you should be worried. It means that there is something sinister going on and you are not able to appreciate it on the CT. On the MR, on the other hand, you can very clearly see these, the infarct. So this is what we call a diffusion weighted imaging and this is an ADC. 
so what was white here has become black here so if you see white and then becoming black then it is a sure sign of an acute infarct so this infarct is a few hours old and this is the angio so this is the neck part and you can see that this carotid artery is irregular and shaggy here and irregular and shaggy here so and the middle cerebral artery is very thin on this side on this side it is very good this is the right side the left side so there is a thrombus which is sitting you can see it is becoming smaller from from the petrous internal carotid artery so this is a large thrombus in the internal carotid artery so what are the contraindications what contraindications are hemorrhage beyond the window period less than 18 and more than 80 i think this is more for uh, uh, we ignore this honestly I, the youngest child that i have treated is a 6 year old and the oldest that i have treated is a 94 year old if the patient is active why should we deny patient the treatment we should treat on the other hand a large stroke which is uh, one third of the middle cerebral artery these patients usually are not treated because the risk of hemorrhage is very high conversion of pale infarct into red infarct is very high and if the patient is on warfarin, many of the patients with alveolar heart disease or with atrial fibrillation are on anticoagulation. So there we, we try and bring the INR to 1.5, but many times we don't try to bring it down. Even at 2, we have 1.5, 1.7, we have sometimes done this. So what is the window? The window is IV injection again, let me tell you, 1 to 3 hours extended to 4.5 hours. Altiplase is more expensive, tenecteplase is cheaper. Tenecteplase has been approved in India. It has not been approved in many countries in the world. But in India, tenecteplase is approved. It is much cheaper and it is also more effective. For large vessel occlusion, like I told you, middle cerebral artery, internal cerebral artery, vertebral artery, basilar artery, we should do a thrombectomy. And this can only be done if a large vessel imaging has been done and the infarct has been diagnosed. So there, the window has been extended to 8 hours. Rather than confine oneself to time, people are wondering what happens to patients who are wake up stroke, for instance, or patients where you're not sure when the stroke occurred, like in the, if it's in the dominant hemisphere, patient has aphasia. So now we use imaging as the criteria. So in the diffuse trial, the, the limit has been extended to 16 hours and in the dawn trial to 24 hours. The difference is that we do a diffusion weighted scan and then we do a perfusion scan. We inject on IV contrast and do a perfusion scan. And if you find that there is a big mismatch between the diffusion scan and the perfusion scan, it means that there is a large area of the brain, the penumbra, which can be salvaged. So there we have extended the window from 16 hours to even 24 hours. In fact, in one patient, we have even gone to 36 hours because there was a big discrepancy between the clinical and the radiological picture. And thrombectomy today, we don't do thrombolysis anymore. In fact, I have not done uh, intra-arterial thrombolysis for the last seven or eight years. We do clot aspiration or we do clot extraction with a special... So the clot aspiration is done with a large catheter. The clot extraction is done with a special non-detachable detachable stent. Or you may need to use a combination. Sometimes the thrombus is very sticky and it does not come in... a suction or it does not come in uh, the catheter so the b2 in that case we take both we take the big catheter and we take the stent so after this study a series of studies of 2015 in fact the nihilistic attitude which doctors had has changed because of large vessel imaging showing that if you recanalize the artery the patients do very well so as i've said here for the first time, we could see clinical improvement in patients in 70% of patients. 70% of patients go back to their previous life, which is unbelievable, which was unbelievable before 2015. And the other great thing is we can recanalize the artery in 15 minutes. When we were doing thrombolysis, we used to take almost one hour to do this. So today, this is the ideal lab, a biplane neuro lab. This is not a cath lab. This is a neuro lab. And on a neuro lab, you can also do a CT scan. So there are some, in fact, in Ahmedabad, one of our friends has got, he doesn't send his patients to CT or MR. He takes the patient straight 
to the neuro lab and he can do a ct on the with the same machine so he does a ct he rules out hemorrhage and he goes ahead and, and does the thrombo uh, thrombectomy or whatever thrombolysis if required so if you have a biplane you can see in two planes simultaneously what is happening which is ideal so these are the various types there are aspiration catheters and these are the stent retrievers the aspiration catheters are large bore thin walled catheters so they cannot go be taken up only on a wire they have to be taken up in a smaller catheter so we take a smaller catheter inside a 065 this is a big catheter you know huge catheter big pipes so with that we can suck so this is an animation to show how it is done the wire is brought up into the carotid uh, artery and you can see there is a thrombus which is sitting there so we bring a guiding catheter up here and a micro catheter which goes across and then we position the big catheter suction catheter against the clot and then we connect it to a suction device and then we apply suction and the clot just gets pulled out of course it looks very elegant sometimes in about at least 60% of patients the clot can be extracted in the first pass but usually by the third pass almost 95% of patients have had their clot removed if thrombectomy fails uh, by aspiration then one can use a stent retriever in fact people have different preferences but it has been shown that the stent retriever is perhaps a little better than the aspiration catheter alone and a stent retriever if it is combined with a balloon catheter then it works even better oops i think this somehow it stopped working anyway so the stent is deployed across the thrombus and the thrombus is the balloon is inflated the artery is carotid artery for instance is occluded and then the whole device is removed it comes out from say from the middle cerebral artery to internal carotid artery to common carotid artery and then we remove it and when we re restore flow we call it according to the tk grade thrombolysis in cerebral infarction flow grading so in <coughs> <coughs> sorry in grade zero there is no perfusion at all the artery is completely cut off that's the middle cerebral artery in grade one there is some perfusion but hardly anything going beyond in grade 2a there is partial perfusion and you can see some branches in b you may see smaller branches and in three is a completely normal circulation what we always aim for is 2b or 3 great tiki 2b or tiki 3 which is a complete reperfusion of the brain so this i'll just show you a couple of examples this was a 58 year old gentleman who had had a bypass done 10 days earlier he was still in the hospital woke up in the morning suddenly and had a paralysis of the left side because he had those sternal wires mri was not possible so ct was done and on the ct you can see this is the left carotid artery in the neck and this is the end in the head on the right side from here onwards petrous internal carotid onwards you don't see the internal carotid artery you don't see the middle cerebral artery at all this is a nice color picture to show the same so this is a normal left carotid artery on the right side we don't see an artery at all we don't see the middle cerebral artery we don't see the internal carotid artery so what we have done is this is the this was the ct uh, cta and now this is the dsa you can see the artery is becoming thinner and thinner and thinner very slowly it is coming up to the intracranial artery so this is the ophthalmic artery this thin artery here is the ophthalmic artery so beyond that you can see the meniscus of the filling defect of the thrombus in the internal carotid artery and first pass of the stent and you can see the artery looks so nice all the arteries all the branches even the tiny perforators here can be seen so we have restored what we call as tiki 3 recanalization after we have done this we always do a ct scan immediately and again after 6 hours because you may have immediate hemorrhage or you may have a delayed hemorrhage 
so we make sure that there is no hemorrhage that we have produced this is the stent you can see the stent so this is this stent is attached it is not it cannot be detached so these are special stents meant for thrombectomy and luckily like i told you for us industry has tried to keep pace and give us better and better devices so virtually every 6 months there is a new device the latest on the market is the embolo trap embo trap which has come from johnson and johnson maybe it is the best one they claim it is the best one we have to try it out and see but these devices have really made a big big difference in the outcome of patients who have a major stroke so this gentleman who had a complete left hemiplegia is he had a left facial weakness and a left hemiplegia this this is day 2 this is day 2 of his uh, completely normal this was not possible without thrombectomy Marv marvelous results complete hemiplegia complete facial paralysis completely normal this was a lady who went to another hospital and the ct ruled out hemorrhage she had a hemiplegia so the doctors there started the iv injection lysis and then shifted the patient to our hospital where we could do the thrombectomy because the patient had not recovered so when the patient came we said we'll now because there is a delay of a few hours let us do a new mr and see how big the infarct is so this is this is a fairly large infarct here and if you look at the angio this is the middle cerebral artery on the right side uh, on the left side on the right side there is no middle cerebral there is no internal carotid artery there is no middle cerebral artery so it is a major artery occlusion and there is a big infarct so after debate should we do should we not do finally the family also insisted that we do it we did the thrombectomy and the artery opened at the second pass it did not open at the first pass but look at the clot that we got this is almost like a cholesterol it is you know it was gritty to the feel it was like it had calcium in it so this kind of a plaque we were able to pull out and the patient again this was several hours after you can see the size of the infarct and yet the patient has made a very good recovery so again complete hemiplegia on the left side and look she is walking around in fact in this patient because of the large infarct she also had a mass effect and because of the mass effect she had to have a decompression so she has a large craniectomy where a large part of the skull has been removed so that we can provide space for the brain to expand and the patient recovered so well so let me insist again ask for a cta ask for an mra and send a patient where full treatment of stroke can be done not only iv but if if intervention is required intervention is also possible and today what you need is a good cath lab to be able to do a thrombectomy and of course somebody who is trained in neuro intervention somebody who knows about the cerebral vasculature and who knows how to handle these delicate catheters and delicate arteries so this is essentially about the, the treatment of acute stroke but what happens if the patient recovers we should do investigate to find out what caused the stroke so that it doesn't get a stroke again so the common blood tests are blood sugar of course we check the sugar the lipid profile homocysteine b12 and thyroid high homocysteine low b12 is a substrate for stroke and the other tests that should be done are doppler for carotids it is a simplistic test i do not rely much on doppler because i find that many times i have had patients reported as normal artery and we have found severe, severe stenosis and vice versa i have had reports of severe stenosis and completely normal artery why this happens is because of tortuosity of the cervical carotid in the neck and if there are some movements or if there is calcification the doppler imaging is not very easy cta or mra is more reliable i would prefer mra because cta again can be obscured by heavy calcium in the artery a 2d echo is done because one must rule out 
uh, atrial fibrillation, I mean, uh, thrombus in the heart, which is the most common cause of embolic uh, stroke. And if the patient has atrial fibrillation, Colter will, will show it. If the 2D echo is normal and the patient has definitely had a stroke, one should do a TEE, transesophageal echo, because sometimes calcification of the I mean, thrombi in the aorta or even in the appendages are better picked up on the TEE, transesophageal echo. And if a patient has a cardiac source of embolus, then what we have to use are anticoagulants. If the patient does not have a cardiac source, then we use antiplatelet. So this is very important that you determine what is the source of the embolus. Is it the heart or is it the arteries? Is it atheromatous? If it is atheromatous, we give antiplatelet, aspirin, clopidogrel, relenta, or uh, what is that? Uh, not ticlopidin. Ticlopidin was used in the past. Now we don't use it anymore. Um, Celestazole. If it is uh, clots in the heart, then we use anticoagulant. If we are using warfarin, we have to keep the warfarin, keep the INR between 2 and 3. But people are now using more and more newer anticoagulants. The advantage being you don't need to check the INR. But as of today, I think we have antidotes to Debigatran because if there is hemorrhage, then you need to neutralize the anticoagulants. So, Debigatran has anticoagulants. The others as yet don't have very definite anticoagulants. So, patient with atrial fibrillation, patient with uh, thromba in the heart must be anticoagulated. And if there, if there is stenosis of the carotid artery, I'll just show you one quick slide showing the technique for uh, angioplasty stenosis of the carotid. So, this is a DSA which shows the focal stenosis of the internal carotid artery. So we cross the stenosis using a very delicate wire and this is done under technique called road mapping where we can see precisely what we are doing and because the head and neck do not move as they are fixed we can do this road mapping technique so we we twirl the wire until we find the true lumen crossover then we deploy a filter so this is the filter this filter is enclosed in a sheath when we pull the sheath out the filter opens out then with the filter in place we bring a balloon up, we do an angioplasty. You can see the waste of the balloon opening up. And then we use a stent. This is a carotid stent, which is a self-expanding stent. So this is also enclosed in a sheath. When we pull the sheath back, the stent opens out fully. And sometimes there is a residual stenosis of the stent, especially if the plaque is heavily calcified. In that case, we use a second balloon to open the artery. In patients who are octogenarians, over 80, who, pay, who are over 75, we try not to use the second balloon because after we have done a stent plasty, bradycardia is very common and hypotension is very common. And sometimes it can be very profound. So by my message would be, be fast. Be fast when you think of stroke. Don't waste time. So what also this is an acronym for when we say B, B for balance, the patient has imbalance, it is a posterior circulation stroke. Eyes, if the vision is blurred or the patient is blind, it can be, if it is one eye, then it is carotid artery. If it is both eyes or if it is blurred, then it is posterior circulation. The face drooping, arm weakness, speech, the speech difficulty, if it is dominant hemisphere, the patient is not able to find words, he uses jargonal speech. If it is uh, carotid territory, it will be slurred speech. If it is cerebellar territory also, it will be slurred speech. And the T is for time to call ambulance and to shift the patient to the hospital immediately. So one has to be fast and treat all cases of sudden loss of function as stroke. Not as epilepsy, not as hypo, low sugar, not as high sugar. You assume that it is a stroke and shift the patient to a hospital where CTA or MRA can be done. Blood pressure is treated only if it is more than 200. Sugar, if it is more than 400 or below 85, uh, 65. And there are many physicians who also start alteplase and tenecteplase if hemorrhage has been ruled out. 
So we have some modifiable risk factors, some over which we have no control. The non-modifiable risk factors are say sex, age, and heritage. We can't do anything about our if we are protected from stroke and heart attack up to menopause if we are female. If we are male, there is no protection. Modifiable risk factors are hypertension, diabetes, obesity, cardiac disease, atrial fibrillation. There are many patients who have atrial fibrillation who are not given anticoagulation. The chance of a stroke is high because they can form clots which will embolize. Raised homocysteine and prior TIO stroke. And of course, smoking. In fact, more than lung, I see patients with vascular disease being uh, smokers. So we can change our behavior by smoking less, <coughs> drinking with uh, limits, within limits, and increase our physical activity. Especially as we grow older, we should do these things. Thank you so much for your attention. I, it has been rather exhaustive. But I hope uh, it has been useful for you. Thank you so much. Sir, uh, I'm sure the everybody would have loved the presentation. It was very interesting. So we'll just move towards the questions now. We've received a couple of questions from our viewers. So the first sure. question is from Dr. Sayyad Johar, who is asking, are there any specific diet recommendations post thromectomy? I do not really talk about the uh, diet because I leave that to the uh, uh, dietitians to decide because our diet is so different you know it may be vegetarian it may be non-vegetarian so I leave it to the dietitian I tell that the patients you go and ask a dietitian okay so another question is how important it is for the first medical contact maybe usually a general physician, to correctly diagnose and manage acute stroke. What algorithm would you uh, suggest here? I think the most important thing is that the first doctor who sees the patient, because he is the most important. So he first is don't, not to keep him waiting in his clinic. Take the patient up first, as soon as he comes to the clinic. Second is do a quick neurological examination. Do an examination of the blood sugar and blood pressure if the blood sugar is low it is hypoglycemia if it is high it is hyperglycemia above 400 treat below 85 below 65 treat bp only if it is more than 200 because this is a compensation to restore blood flow to the brain so if you treat the blood pressure which is 180 you will precipitate a stroke and send the patient as quickly as possible for imaging. That is the most important thing. And today, I would again insist on not only CT or only MRI. I would insist on CTA so that one can image the vessel. So you see this cause, this, the cause of the stroke, which is the angiogram, the size of the stroke. If you do an MRI, you can see this, this precise site, the precise size. So that you know what needs to be done next. You cannot start treatment at home. You cannot start treatment without any form of imaging. Sure, sir. Uh, there's one another question. So, one, uh, more sorry, thing, sir. Yeah, yeah. one more thing, if I may add. After IV thrombolysis has been done, uh, if you have used altiplase or tenetiplase, you do not give aspirin for 24 hours. Okay. So therefore, usually we try and avoid stenting in the acute situation. In PAMI, the cardiologists deploy a stent. We try and avoid a stent as far as possible in the acute stage because we cannot give antiplatelet. And if you're deploying a stent, you need to give antiplatelet. Correct. So we are very, very cherry of giving, uh, using a stent. Unless we, are, we think the artery is closing down again, we don't use a stent in the acute setting. Uh, thank you, sir. Very well answered. And I think there's just a last question. What are the inclusion criteria for patients with thrombectomy in acute stroke? There is no... Inclusion meaning patient has a stroke, patient has a large vessel occlusion. The main, these are the two main things. For thrombectomy, there has to be a large vessel occlusion. So you have to have an imaging which shows occlusion of the carotid artery, 
middle cerebral artery, basilar artery, posterior cerebral artery. Nowadays, it is being extended to smaller arteries as well. So sometimes a patient comes with just aphasia. And when you do uh, an MRA, you find that one branch is missing. Earlier, we used to say we confine ourselves to the M1, the proximal cerebral, middle cerebral artery. But today, you can, we have got smaller stents. You can go with a smaller stent to the distal artery and even smaller branches. And the recovery is so dramatic. If the patient, say, for instance, somebody who's got aphasia and you restore his speech, it is so rewarding. You feel so happy. So today, there is no such thing as the, the contraindications are, like I said, hemorrhage, a large infarct, and coagulation disorder. These are the three. Today, these are the three main contraindications. There are no other real contraindications. And age is really not a criterion. Like I told you, we, the youngest we have done is a six-year-old. And the oldest is a 90-year-old. So today, age is not a criterion. Was the patient functional before the stroke? If the patient was functional before the stroke, we should do the maximum. Because you restore the quality of life. It is the quality of life which we are improving. Correct. Otherwise... Here, you know, we have we don't have social structure to support a family in the a patient who has got a stroke. It is a family who has to look after. And if you have in one family one patient who is quadriplegic, who has a tracheostomy, who has a feeding, uh, who has a feeding peg, endoscopic gastrostomy done, life can be very difficult for the entire family. So we have one more thing. Initially, the patient tells us, "Are kitna kharcha hoga?" Patient do din mein hospital mein tha. In fact, most of these patients go home on day four or day five. So they are in the hospital for at least three or four days. And many of them, if they have come in time, 70% of our patients go back to normal life. So they have spent a lot of money because the, the stent costs about two lakh rupees. If you use a suction device, it is about three lakh rupees. So on day one, the patient is spending about two and a half to three lakhs plus ICU, plus anesthesia, all that. But look at the quality of life. And... There is no expense later because the patient is normal. Whereas if a patient has stroke, nothing is done. You spend the same money plus the agony of having a patient over the next months, maybe years. Initially, expense is high. There is no question. But I think it is worth And today, the, in many places, the government has these schemes where you can get up to one and a half, two lakhs. So I am sure that uh, even companies strongly support so if we say that a patient is poor, a stent which costs 2 lakhs, they will give us for 1 lakh. So we also get support from industry. There is no question. So I would push if you push for large vessel occlusion documentation. And if you find that there is a large vessel occlusion, push for a stroke. Of course, the window is there. You cannot, you cannot do it, say, after 24 hours, after 48 hours. It was 4 days before. So when we talk about a stroke, some patients tell me, ye do din pehle tha, ya abhi kal hua tha. we need to know precisely when. And especially for a patient who, who has a stroke on waking up, the wake up stroke, that is always a real problem. Should we treat this patient? Should we not treat this patient? Because the risk is hemorrhage, conversion of a pale infarct into a red infarct. Okay. It will make the patient worse. Beautifully answered, sir. I think uh, our uh, our doctors would be more than happy to hear this interesting conversation here. And sir, thank you so much again for taking out time from your busy schedule and talking to us live on this pressing issue of acute stroke. I think uh, the medical community would greatly benefit from it, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Pleasure to be with you. Same here, sir. Thank you so much.